talk about three stories, but first I have to talk about what we just tasted here, the cake that we just ate. How many of you know that making a cake is actually chemistry? They actually apply chemistry. When you mix different substances or different types of things together and create something new, when you cream your butter and your sugar, you're creating a new compound that doesn't exist. When you add lemon to that, the reaction starts with, lemon, with the lemon. When you add the baking powder and the, the flour, that's what makes the batter. Then you go and cook it. That's a chemistry. That is a chemistry experiment. They actually did chemistry. Maybe without knowing it, but they put chemistry in action. Then when they went to bake the cake, they applied physics. They did indirect heat because they knew if you put it directly on the jiko, it wouldn't work. They have just done innovation without me having to explain what innovation is. I'll give you three other stories and then I'll give you some, some other options. So how many of you have heard of Richard Turede? Richard Turede. Okay, at least my inland people should raise their hands. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, not yet? Okay, good. Okay, so Richard Turere, he was, he is a, a young Maasai boy, lives on the outskirts of uh, Nairobi Park, um, where the savannah starts, and some of you may know that the Maasai live uh, near Nairobi Park, and they always have some trouble with the, um, with the lions and their cattle. So he is a young boy, he was 11 years old, he's now I think 15, but he was 11 years old when he designed a system to keep the lions out of his father's boma to protect his father's cattle. He, used, he did it using a solar panel, a battery, and some flashing lights. 11 years old. That was story number one. Story number two, there was a 14-year-old boy in Malawi. His name is William Kwamboka. And he was 14 years old when he was sent home for lack of school fees. And he lived, he lived in the desert, uh, not in the desert, in the country. And he always had a dream of delivering electricity to his village. And even though he wasn't in school, he had access to a library. He went to the library and one day he saw a picture of a windmill. How many of you know what a windmill is? So he saw a picture of a windmill and learned that it can be used to create electricity and pump water. He read books and built and designed a windmill. And if you were to read his story, he will tell you many people thought he was insane. In fact, on marijuana, including his own mother. But it took him several months and he built the first windmill. And when his neighbor saw him climbing up when it was finally done to put a, a light bulb up there and the light bulb went on, their laughter turned to amazement. And within five minutes, the legs of the, the what are they called? The petals of the, the, the fans of the windmill started moving and he was able to go into the house and in about half an hour put light bulbs into his house. Out came the kerosene lamps, out came the candles. He had put electricity in his parents' home. <coughs> and he has now gone on. This was, gosh, this was 2002. We are now in 2016. And this is a young boy who left school. He has now also built windmills that generate, that pump water to the village. And um, what was my third story going to be? Kelvin. Hmm? Kelvin. No, it wasn't it for Kelvin. So there was Kamboka, there was Turere, there was a third story. I've forgotten what my third story is. <laughs> Good clap, I'll tell you. What are these stories to tell you? These stories are to tell you innovation starts when you eat it. When you, read, when you see that there is a need for something and you figure and you try and determine how to go about building it. The girls that we saw here, they might go into engineering, they might try and do they have learned that you don't need to go to one point to buy a, an oven to make something. Maybe the principal and the director will let them build their own indirect oven here. Maybe they'll start baking you a cake once a month. I don't know. <laughs> but this is how we encourage innovation. 
William Kamboka, do you know he built his windmill out of bicycle parts, light bulbs, an old shock absorber, and, vice, and uh, plastic pipes that he bent and molded by fire? When you have an idea, you don't let your circumstances stop you. You find a way to use what is around you. So we at Global Minimum decided that we needed a way to expose our youth to hands-on critical learning, hands-on tools. Because sometimes playing with your hands opens up doors that you never really thought possible. It, it gives you a new avenue of, of applying what you think you know. Like the students that were up here, some of them were having a little bit of trouble speaking. I, it's difficult to stand up here and speak, right? It's difficult to say what you think you know, or to try and teach someone what you think you know. So you have, we wanted to give students the opportunity to apply what they are learning in school and add to other, or when you are applying what you know, questions come when you actually have things in your hand, when you actually have to plug A into B then you really start asking, why is A going into B and not into C? Sometimes when you see it in a book, you're like, okay, A goes into B, A goes into B, you don't argue with it. But when you start playing with it, you start, that's when the questions start. So we decided that we wanted a program to really start um, helping students have access to hands-on skills and see if that would also help them put them in the innovation mindset, right? Um, Richie talked a bit about the In Challenge. That was the first program that Global Minimum started. It started under Innovate Kenya. And it's a camp that we hold where students apply, they send in applications of projects or prototypes they want to build. So they send in an application, they say why this project is important, what it is they want to build, if there is existing, um, if there's an existing product like that in the market, why theirs is better, and also how much, um, how much resources or how much money they will need. So the last camp, how many of you came to Kibuli in August? Were well, there some students here that came to Kibuli in the, the second or the third week of August to our showcase event? No? Okay. So in August, this past August, we had our latest showcase event, and we had a group of 29 students. There were 10, 12 teams, 12 teams com um, combining a total of uh, 29 students. And we had them for a week. They came, we, um, they came with their ideas. What we did was we helped them with, for example, their presentation skills. So there were a few times that week where they actually had to stand up and tell us the, the history of the project, why they came up with it, why it is important, who they are designing their project for, who is their market size, what is their anticipated growth. They also went to various areas within Nairobi to buy the resources they need to build their project. Why? Because they need to know how to get the resources they need, where they will start looking to get the materials of the, the resources they need. We had speakers that, um, that came, that taught them about leadership skills, that taught them how to present their ideas. And then a, a week later, because we started on a Sunday, and on Saturday we had the showcase event. And even the difference we could tell in the students, even from the time we presented on Thursday to the time they presented on Saturday, was just simply amazing. Uh, we just... Uh, the, each of them got up and they had seven minutes to just to go through their projects. We were so amazed, even Savannah was there with us. We were able to get different awards for the, the teams. And I had spoken to, because uh, we had also invited St. Teresa's, I had spoken to one of the students from St. Teresa's, and he was just, <laughs> he was so excited. He was very ready to go and start building his project because he saw what students his age could do give them some time and some resources. So really that's how the In Challenge began the program. Then we noticed that the people attending um, the In Challenge were of, of a certain school set, that we were not getting 
a good idea of students from across Kenya. So we said, well, how do we how do we reach out to some students that maybe don't have the resources? And that's where we developed the in lab program. Now, in the in and in lab and the in and in challenge actually starts stands for innovation. So we just shortened it to innovation challenge, in lab and in challenge. So we created the in-lab program, and we specifically wanted to reach to schools or to students where they may not necessarily have the access that maybe some of the public and national schools do have. Um, and we, were, we had the opportunity uh, through another organization to be told about Kibui. So we came and we worked with the street educators, including our Shege, and we gave them an idea of this is what we want to do with the students, and then we asked them, can you help us find schools? Can you reach out to the schools in the area that you're comfortable with that can give us students? We want to provide hands-on skills. We need the students. Let's see if giving this time, if giving them hands-on can change their critical thinking skills, can give them hands-on experience. If we give them this, will their grades change? What, what other doors can we open by giving this extra time. And really, that's where we are right now. We are working with two other, a total of three schools in the area. Um, Eva comes on Tuesdays. And it's, it's a pilot program. We're trying our best. So right now, we can only take 24. No promises, but that's what we're, we're, we're doing right now. So that's a little bit about our organization. I want to be up here to tell you also about some of our partner, um, oh, some of our partners that also have programs that you may be interested in. So the first one here is um, African Leadership uh, Academy, and I'll give these handouts to the principal. African Leadership Academy is an academy in Johannesburg. And what they do is they accept students from between, they start with students between the age of 16 and 19. It's a two-year program and where they, their focus is leadership. They really are trying to encourage leadership within the African continent. So they run a program each year. I think they accept, I think it's about 200 students each year. And as they continue with the core curriculum, geography, physics, history, English, all that, they also give you entrepreneurship and leadership classes. So that at the end of your two years, you are more strategically placed to be to think about how you can assist Africa and your respective countries um, or on a much better level. They also then find uh, opportunities or universities in the US um, that the students can then go on to with the requirement that once they are finished um, their undergraduate degrees, you must hold you must come to your respective country, or at least come to Africa, and start developing something. You can come back and be an engineer and work for the government. You can come back and be an engineer and start your own <coughs> company. The point is come back and grow Africa. There's, we talk so much about brain drain, where all of our smart minds in all of Africa are going to the US, they're going to Canada, they're going to Europe. We, as Africa, are the largest growing population in the world. If we ourselves do not take care of our continent and our country, who will? So they are starting their applications. Um, <clears throat> their application criteria, they have six application criteria. One of them is